Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma Talk is given by Robert Coho Epstein. May we completely realize the true mind of all Buddhas um, is, a, is kind of relative, relevant to, uh, to what I'd like to talk about tonight. Um, I'd like to uh, talk about uh, meditation methods tonight, just uh, give a quick review and then focus in on one of them. Um, I think it's nice to know what the different practices are. We may be familiar with some of them from our own schools and not necessarily uh, those of the others, but um, they're all like spokes of the same uh, wheel coming from the same hub and going back to the same hub. So I'd like to do a quick review of the different meditation methods that are used throughout Zen practice. The purpose of all of these methods is to realize or gain insight into our true nature as beings, at least that's one way of putting it, and the true nature of our existence. So that's a pretty heady um, intention. There are various aspects of this, and this is expressed in different ways. When we realize that we're connected to others and not merely separate beings, it awakens the desire to end suffering, not just for ourselves, but for others around us and throughout the world. When we realize that we are not just bodies with thoughts running through our heads, but that it is somewhat miraculous and a mystery that we are conscious beings who are, have sentience and can experience the world around us, we may stop taking life for granted as a kind of matter of fact existence and may see that everything we experience is a kind of miracle. Um, it's strange that we have living beings and that we are living beings and that this has come to be. It would be one thing to be a camera and take pictures without experiencing them. And you could say in a sense that that camera would still have senses. It's still picking up visual material. But to see a flower and be able to fully take in the various aspects of that experience consciously is quite amazing. When we realize that our mind's very nature is both empty and aware, that creates a certain kind of freedom and wonder in our experiencing. So there are a number of meditation methods that have come down through various Zen schools. Um, and they're all intriguing and worthwhile and all aim in the direction of becoming more conscious and, and have a deeper understanding. Um, it's been said uh, by quite a few experienced teachers that in the final analysis, all the schools open up the same capacity, but they arrive there by different methods. The major methods are following the breath, counting the breath, and those are pretty common to a lot of the schools. Controlling the breath and using the breathing to enter samadhi, which is an important practice, especially in Rinzai Zen. Koan study, which is the heart of Rinzai practice and is employed in other schools as well. And engagement with a Huatu or Huadu, which comes from the Chinese Chan tradition and is especially associated with Korean Zen and the method of the Soto school, which is called Shikantaza, or deceptively just sitting. Koans or Kongans are stories or scenarios that the practitioner engages with in Zazen. Huatus or Huadus overlap with koans to an extent and they're existential meditation questions. Um, and one can meditate on one of those if you're using that method of uh, Zen meditation for years. There are other methods in some of the Zen schools that are also of interest, among them mindful mountain wandering from the Chinese tradition, which is still practiced today in some of the schools, and a really nice one, Ti Gong Fu, a meditative tea preparation and, and tea drinking. And that relates to the Japanese uh, tea ceremony as well. So having reviewed most or many of the Zen meditation techniques above in a minute or two, 
Um, tonight, I'd like to focus on Shikantaza, or just sitting, the method of the Soto school, and a couple of relevant quotes that I think are very intriguing. I'd like to start out by saying that all roads lead to Shikantaza. In a moment when the mind is clear and there's just the simple presence of sitting or being present, there it is, that's Shikantaza. So I think it's of interest to practitioners of all the schools. Shikantaza is the state of being present and being aware. And that is really the state of mind of all of Zen. As a Rinzai teacher said recently, we wind up doing Shikantaza too. We just approach it through different methods. So I'll give you a quick review of, uh, of where Shikantaza comes from. And this may be a little bit controversial because there are some Soto folks who say that Shikantaza doesn't come from anywhere. It comes from Dogen, who was the founder of the Soto school. But it does have a history. And um, it starts with the Kaodong school, which emanated from Master Dongshan in China. And the Kaodong school's method of silent illumination sitting, which then morphed into the method of the Soto school in Japan. Um, in China during the Tang Dynasty, the Kaodong school emphasized silent illumination, which was also known as serene reflection practice. And there are some controversies, not only within the succession of that technique, but also between the schools uh, during that time in history. It's also within uh, silent illumination itself, if you look at the writings on silent illumination, that it's not about merely quieting the mind and reaching a more peaceful state. And uh, sometimes people mistook it for that. And when they did, they would do the kind, the kind of uh, uh, yogic practice. I mean, Zen itself is a yogic practice, but within yoga and yogic samadhi and the practice of yoga, uh, dhyana, um, one could sedate the mind to the point where you'd be in a very peaceful and happy state for a temporary period of time. But when you came back out of that state, none of the problems of the mind or the issues of one's own uh, obstacles had really been dealt with. So it's not really a state of greater awareness and doesn't lead to greater awareness. And so uh, sometimes the, uh, the schools that were practicing more active forms of meditation would criticize the silent illumination folks for falling into quiescence. And... Um, they would shoot back some other kind of criticism the other way. But um, silent illumination or serene reflection um, is not uh, really a school of quiescence. And here's a quote from Wiki. Uh, the first Chan teacher to articulate silent illumination was Kao Dong master Hang Ji Zheng Zhue, 1091 to 1157 also known as Tian Tang. And as Tian Tang, he is the composer of the verses in the Book of Serenity, for those who uh, ever uh, went into those koans, which are very nice. Um, and he first wrote an inscription entitled Silent Illumination Meditation, and that's how the term got started. Ru Jing uh, was a Kao Dong master a little further on, and he's the one who gave Dogen the founder of Soto Zen Dharma Transmission in China. And he was the one, Ru Jing, who first called this type of meditation just sitting. Uh, Dogen adopted that Chinese term and translated it into Japanese. And that's how we got Shikantaza, uh, just sitting, which is also literally translated as nothing but sitting. And that's a little bit more descriptive of, of, of what it is than just sitting. Because uh, as I like to say, uh, just sitting uh, meditation is not just sitting around. <laughs> if you're just kind of hanging out and sitting, you know, it's not necessarily shikantaza. Um, so Dogen brought silent illumination practice back from China and refined it in his way of doing it as shikantaza, the Japanese term for just sitting. 
which is characterized uh, as having this unusual uh, setup of um, having no object of focus and no distraction from the simple fact of being present. Uh, it's even said sometimes slightly physicalistically that, um, that just being aware that you're sitting is the basic practice. And that actually relates back to what uh, Buddha said in one of the uh, suttas. I'm not going to try to remember the Pali name of it because I know I'll mess it up. But uh, it's the embodied awareness sutta in my, uh, my loose translation, where he says that when one is sitting, one should be aware that they're sitting. When standing, be aware that you're standing. When walking, be aware that you're walking. Um, which seems like an awfully simplistic practice. I mean, yeah, yeah, I know when I'm standing up and when I'm sitting down. That's not a problem for me. But actually being aware that you're sitting when you're sitting and being mindful aware of it is a little bit uh, more present than what we normally do when we're sitting, which is we drift to various mental objects. So here you're just sitting and you're focused on the just sitting. Um, and there's a quote from Huike, uh, from uh, uh, from um, Hang Ji. Uh, actually, this is not Hang Ji. I was going to correct myself to Hang Ji, but actually, it is Huike, uh, if I've got that right. The second Chinese patriarch, quoted in the introduction to the Book of Serenity by Cleary. I know somebody's going to come along and correct some of my facts and names. Um, which gives a good indication of the kind of presence that we're talking about. And that presence is sometimes seen as the fundamental quality of Shikantaza meditation. So this is from the second patriarch, Chinese patriarch. If you want to clarify the fundamental mind, you should examine carefully in the midst of sense impacts. Before you produce thought and reflection, where does the mind go? Is it non-existent? Is, is, is it existent? Not falling into being or non-being or into any fixed location, the mind pearl shines alone. It always shines on the world without a particle of obstruction, without an instant of discontinuity. Sitting with full attention, we can become aware of this presence of mind. There's a couple of interesting things in there, one of which is... Uh, Examine carefully in the midst of sense impacts. I think that's really important and it applies very well to silent illumination as well and to Shikantaza just sitting. It's not saying to suppress thoughts or get rid of them. You know, push the thoughts out of your mind, which is not a great practice, which some people practice. Um, but even though thought may subside if you get into um, an open and peaceful enough state, your goal is not to get rid of thoughts, but it's to examine carefully in the midst of sense impacts, while thoughts are arising and falling away, while you're getting sensations and whatever else comes in uh, through the five uh, senses, what is the nature of the mind? Um, also, uh, the mind pearl shines alone, um, it always shines without an instant of discontinuity. And that's also a very important uh, statement by the second patriarch. Because there are many theories in Buddhism of the mind, of consciousness arising and falling away with the object of consciousness. But they're talking about a kind of presence of awareness that is continuous and is not interrupted by the rising and falling of sense objects. And it also reminds me of the great mirror wisdom and uh, other aspects of Zen that one can look into and compare. So um, the idea of silent illumination or shikantaza is pretty radical. It can be pretty hard to do without getting confused when you're starting out in, in Zen meditation. You don't really wanna be thrown onto a cushion and said, you know, don't do anything, just sit. Uh, the mind goes crazy, and you don't know what to focus on. So 
I think even in Soto school, they don't start out that way for the most part, even though, even though Dogen, the founder, recommended just, just doing that. Um, and most of the schools, including uh, a lot of the Soto schools, uh, start with following the breath, counting the breath. And I know advanced practitioners as well, including, I'm not saying I'm an advanced practitioner, but including myself, uh, who start out um, by winding down, focusing on the breath, counting the breath, and then open up into the other practices once you're kind of settled in, um, including just sitting and koan contemplation. Um, so you could say that in Shikantaza, uh, and let's consider it then an advanced form of meditation, the object of meditation is, medita is the meditation itself. It's, it's being present in sitting. When thoughts or sensations arise, they're noticed, but they're not turned into objects of, fo of focus. If you get an itch in your leg, um, you know, in some methods, you focus on the itch in the leg and say, itch, sensation, sensation, or whatever, let it go, and then go back to the breathing. In Shikantaza, you take whatever experiences arise like that and you flatten them. You let them have equal weight with all the other experiences that you're having. And you could say that the kind of awareness that you have is a special kind of mindfulness. Rather than being very, mindfulness of, very mindful of everything that's happening, you have a kind of peripheral mindfulness or peripheral awareness that's trying to equalize all your experience and see it all as part of an unbroken field of present awareness. So that's a, it is an advanced practice and it's a little bit different than focusing on what's happening, going back to the breath and having the breath to center you. The breath too is included in your awareness. So the breathing is still something that you ground yourself in. You're still grounded in the hara and you're still, you still have that grounding, but rather than focusing in the hara and the breathing, you're including that in the equilibrium and the equal awareness of everything else. So it's a kind of decentering and de boundaryizing practice as well. Um, so you try not to take anything that arises and separate it out into a separate object. There's a sense of presence and the sense of presence can become quite strong in its own right and when that happens, then one is sitting in that sense of presence. And that becomes the sense of the meditation. Okay. So here's a description of Shikantaza from Wikipedia, which I think is pretty good. Um, quote. In the Soto school of Zen, Shikantaza, meditation with no objects, anchors, or content is the primary form of practice. The meditator strives to be aware of the stream of thoughts, allowing them to arise and pass away without interference. So whatever arises is allowed, but not um, held onto or pushed away, just allow it to take its course. And with that as a background, I'd like to go to another quote, one of my favorite quotes that's really kind of jam-packed with practice material. Um, and Hang Ji is the person I'm quoting, and he was the master of silent illumination. And I continue to go back to this quote and find it very rich in structure and a kind of a roadmap for the entire path of Zen in a way. The practice of true reality is simply to sit serenely in silent introspection. When you have fathomed this, you cannot be turned around by external causes and conditions. This empty, wide open mind is subtly and correctly illuminated, spacious and content, without confusion from inner thoughts of grasping, effectively overcome habitual behavior, and realize the self that is not possessed by emotions. Such upright, independent spirit can begin not to pursue degrading situations. 
Here you can rest and become clean, pure, and lucid. Bright and penetrating, you can immediately return, accord, and respond to deal with events. Everything is unhindered. There's more to the quote, but I'll leave it at that for, for today and just focus briefly on a couple of uh, sentences before I wind up. Um, I am so intrigued by this statement. I hope it's translated correctly and hasn't led me down the wrong path. But to simply, to sit, the practice of true reality is simply to sit serenely in silent introspection. Now, those two words, silent introspection, really, uh, I think are quite wonderful. Usually, if we think about introspection, you know, we're taking stock and we're going through things and we're taking account of items, you know, introspection about ourselves, you know, what do I have to work through? What are my obstacles? What am I, these points, those points, what am I working on? You know, who am I um, in various ways? But silent introspection means to go one layer deeper, the way I'm interpreting it, and introspect, look into the very nature of presence or existence. So it's a kind of uh, focused uh, looking into the whole situation of being. And so I find that a pretty inspiring uh, statement. And when you have fathomed this, you cannot be turned around by external causes and conditions, and you can start to not pursue degrading situations. And this also relates back to something the Buddha said in another one of the suttas. I think it's from the Satipatthana uh, Sutta, where he talks about the different, what I'll call levels and probably be criticized for it, different levels of meditation from sensation to emotion to thought and objects of thought. Um, where he would make these distinctions between thoughts that were skillful and wholesome, depending on how you translate uh, kusala and thoughts that were unskillful and unwholesome and that would lead you into suffering states. And uh, Hui Nang in Zen also picks up on this and says that a single uh, enlightened thought uh, puts you on the level of the Buddhas, while a single uh, deluded thought will throw you down into a suffering state. You may have said hell state in some translations. Uh, so this idea of getting a uh, a very stable sense of basic uh, being and being present and allowing it to become stable enough so that you can take it into various situations and not be led down a degrading or suffering path, I think is uh, very intriguing about this method and um, nice to take with us. So thank you. <laughs>